practical circumstances. Uh, I think, uh, consider, for example, the, uh, the consequences of the availability, the widespread inex availability of inexpensive uh, safe contraceptives in terms of uh, sexual revolution and, uh, and uh, all sorts of fundamental intimate changes in attitudes when they consider the uh, consequences of the AIDS epidemic on that prior perspective. AIDS epidemic, by the way, certainly has some technological uh, aspects to it in the sense that the world is now sexually intercommunicating uh, entity, which was not the case before. The planet was broken up into a huge number of small groups. It's clear that in this transitional time we should have serious problems. Could not be obvious. And the question before us is how to manage those problems so that they don't do us in. There's such a thing as being too smart for our own good. And that's the danger. That we're extremely smart with all kinds of technology and extremely foolish in the development of wisdom and ethics to control the dangerous use of that technology. For me, a uh, useful, also personal, uh, important example of the dual use of technology is the, the very thing that, uh, that I spend so most of my time on, and that is sort of the exploration of the planet, slash space goes. Uh, here I claim it is uh, wholly of the cost comparatively money, it expands our perspectives and horizons, it gives us an opportunity to better understand our own planet by looking at other planets, it gives us a perspective on the rarity and fragility of worlds by our own it incites the spirit of the exploration and discovery and adventure in the sense of a, of a positive future which is desperately needed and yet Look at that technology. What is the technology that I use? I use a rocket technology, which equally can be used to transport nuclear weapons halfway around the world to annihilate all men, women, and children in some city who we have no particular quarrel with. Uh, the Voyager spacecraft that uh, is now approaching Neptune, which is so far from the sun that we could not possibly use solar energy, is powered by the uh, nuclear technology. It involved, I claim, entirely benevolent application for planetary uh, exploration of the outer solar system, and yet that same technology can be used to not only destroy the cities, of nations and global civilization and perhaps even the human species. The powers of our technology are immense. They're awesome. Never before, never before this generation have we had it within our power to destroy so much of us, to destroy a civilization that is worldwide. And so it seems to me there is a particular kind of responsibility that uh, our generation faces, which is much more rigorous, much more difficult, much more important than any previous generation, because our previous generation had the powers that we had. It's very clear that our responsibility at the least extends to understanding what the issues are and to making a powerful citizen interaction in the applications of that technology. The absolute worst thing we could do would be to say, oh, the issues are too complicated for me. I'll leave it to my elected representatives. Um, you can count the fingers of one hand the number of uh, members of Congress who have any training at all in science and technology. 
and yet most of the issues of the character of this is right, or issues involving science and technology. This is foolish. We have a society based on science and technology which hardly anyone understands the science and technology. This is a prescription for disaster. You couldn't do better if you set out to make a catastrophe than to give immense powers to uh, people who have no idea what it is doing. We have a bunch of serious problems. Let me mention a few. <coughs> One I've already alluded to, as did Mr. Bristol, the nuclear arms race. Let me just give it a little bit of a perspective. The United States and the Soviet Union always propelled by self-righteous national pride, patriotism, highest motives, just ask them. As a booby trap client with almost 60,000 of their weapons, most of those weapons more powerful than the bombs that destroyed Hiroshima and Nagasaki. 60,000 of their weapons. Same way. Let's ask this question. How many cities are there on the planet Earth? It'll give us some perspective about uh, whether 60,000 weapons is enough or too much or not enough. Enough, too much, not enough for what? Well, if you listen to leaders and military apologists on both sides, um, and this is changing, um, fortunately, a little bit right now, especially on the Soviet side, but for the entire history of the the last couple of years of the new arms race, the justification given by each side was that these weapons were needed to discourage miscalculation by the other side. This is called deterrence. We have such a powerful retaliatory capability that uh, only a madman on the other side would get attacked. Of course, there have been men <laughs> in terms of uh, major nations in this century. Think of Israel and Islam. So uh, an argument that says this is an effective deterrent except for men and a certain warning flag attached to it, which uh, national leaders don't want to have done. Um, how many cities are there? If you define a city as having 100,000 people or more, there are only 2,300 cities on the earth. 60,000 apartments, 2,300 cities. You can see that there is a certain excess. The United States and the Soviet Union, if they wish to cooperate in such an enterprise, would be fully able, let's just talk about strategic weapons, would be fully able to annihilate every city on the on the planet, we see uh, uh, denoting two weapons for each city to a margin of quote safety. <laughs> <laughs> and then they would have 20,000 strategic nuclear weapons left or as a challenge to the targeteers, <laughs> who are always, by the way, applies to this challenge. The remarkable thing about targeting as each side increments its arsenal, the other side has to increment its arsenal in order to target the other side's incremented arsenal. And um, in mathematics, this is called two coupled linear differential equations, the solution to which is an exponential, it's called the arm um, Another uh, way to characterize this is uh, a single US or Soviet nuclear submarine, that is, submarine with with uh, some launch ballistic missiles, as on the Amazon, is able to annihilate between 150 and 200 cities in the other country. But there are hardly 150 or 200 cities in the other country. A single nuclear submarine can essentially destroy either country. It's an interesting question about under what circumstances does the commander of such a submarine have uh, an opportunity to uh, launch on his own hook? And the uh, private nation is willing to uh, talk about that and classify it. Uh, it's also worrisome if you're concerned about a few people going crazy in crisis. <clears throat> in a so called central ex 
change. There, there is a certain uh, effort made to uh, describe nuclear war in words which pack no emotional punch, whatever. The idea is that you won't worry about it. So uh, a uh, nuclear war in which both nations are annihilated is called a nuclear exchange. <laughs> sort of stock market, use weapons, reason weapons, uh, everybody has. Uh, in a central exchange, the uh, estimates of the number of people killed outright is between several hundred million, which is the equivalent of the total population of the countries, and nearly two billion people, depending on the target. That's prompt effects. The delay of longer term effects, the most serious of which is the clear winter, uh, look according to a uh, range of recent estimates to be able to kill essentially by starvation, destruction of crops, uh, several billion people. Wow, one or two billion, well, several billion. Numbers are a little rough, but it seems to me. To get pretty close to 5 billion, which is all we have. <laughs> so, this is a way of calibrating the technology that we have built up for reasons of patriotism. To be safe, to be safe, we have developed these arsenals of annihilation. 20 minutes, it's all over after the order is given. I don't think it's safe. The body fails to impress them. Uh, I think it is something done immensely foolish with uh, full responsibility on both sides. One characteristic of the nuclear arms race, as in the full set of such problems, <coughs> is the predominance of short term or long term thinking. It is easy to win a congressional race by saying that we need more nuclear weapons, it will make us stronger. It is hard to win a congressional race by saying we need fewer nuclear weapons. That will make us stronger. What are you talking about? It's counterintuitive. Um, and yet the fact is that if the world nuclear arsenals were at a very low level on both sides, with, uh, with intrusive inspection, then if the worst happened, and uh, the war occurred, <clears throat> the worst consequences would not happen. And a small arsenal, a few hundred miles on each side, let's say, with their delivery systems, would be fully adequate for deterrence as well as the existing arsenals. We have done something enormously foolish, and it's been done by Republicans, Democrats, Soviet leaders, and whatever range of sort of ideological variation that exists in the Soviet Union. Um, fully supported very few naysayers in the government or among the public. All we have to do is say it makes you safer and the arguments go down and nobody asks awkward questions. Well, today we are in an interesting moment because uh, the islands are waking up again. People are not simple as much, not lulled into a sense of confidence by a uh, good leaders who say everything will right, even to us. We recognize that monstrous mistakes have been made and that our lives depend on the continued sanity, sobriety, and wisdom of military leaders and civilian leaders in the United States, the Soviet Union, Britain, France, China, Israel, Pakistan, India, um, for all times now, in the indefinite future. That's betting a lot. Stakes are high. The probability that it will remain safe is, I think, very low. We have an urgent necessity to make massive, intrusively instructive efforts in the world of nuclear arsenals, and it's not enough for the United States and the Soviet Union to do it alone after some significant 
indication of their seriousness, which we certainly haven't had yet, um, it is essential to involve those other nations back in 1959. It also saves money. It doesn't save a huge amount of money because nuclear weapons are cheap. More bang for the buck was the way they were sold in the 1950s. But you can save quite a bit of money, nevertheless. Let me uh, come back a little bit to this. But number one, to two other global environmental issues. Let me start with the uh, issue of ozone depletion. Let me say this for clarification that sometimes it's hard to, uh, to follow the arguments. A lot of people are worried about too much ozone um, from uh, in smog, from the pollution factory. Factories. And then at the same time, we hear we're worried about there not being enough of them. Well, the simple answer is that, uh, that ozone is bad down here and good up there. And uh, unfortunately, there's no way to pipe the ozone from down here to up there. Ultraviolet light from the sun is extremely dangerous. Fortunately, we have the ozone layer absorbs that ultraviolet light and protects it, protects us from it. Mars, which has no such ozone layer, has a surface which is fried by ultraviolet light, which is the reason for its antiseptic character. Not only the life that we can find, but not even any organic molecules. The amount of ozone in the Earth's atmosphere up there, if brought down into this room, would be astonishingly little. It would be a quarter of a millimeter thick. That's how much it grows. In the 1930s, American chemists were given a, a challenge. We need a, a working fluid for refrigerators and air conditioning. We need a, a propellant for aerosol spray cans. We need a uh, insulation for, as it turned out, insulation container for fast foods. The last that is non poisonous, non irritating, doesn't make you sneeze or cough, uh, is wholly inner. And they came up with. Uh, a triumph of modern technology, which did all those things. A category of molecules called chlorofluorocarbon CFCs. And uh, it's excellent that the DuPont trade name was uh, Freedom's. And uh, it did all those things. Excellent. It's uh, grown into uh, uh, a multi billion dollar industry in the United States Army. They forgot one thing. This molecule, by virtue of its very inertness, is long life. <clears throat> so uh, back before aerosol spray cans were, uh, were banned in the United States with CFC propellants, here is this area just to, uh, to be able to think it through. <clears throat> it's the uh, 1960s, and you're preparing for the big date. You're in the bathroom, you spray in your arms, and there is a propellant which carries the deodorant out. Of course, because it's inert, it doesn't attach itself to you. It bounces off you, bounces off the mirror in the bathroom, bounces off the walls, and eventually trickles under the door or out the window and finds itself in the very outdoors. There, the CFC molecules bounce into other air molecules, but no chemistry there. They're in there. Um, bounce off buildings and telephone poles. Nothing happens to them. Super molecules. As time goes on, the general circulation of the Earth's atmosphere eventually carries them up to stratospheric altitudes, and there they meet their match. 
because their monastery of the altitude is an extremely chemically reactive molecule, ozone. And it's worse than one CFC molecule destroying one ozone molecule. The CFC molecules are catalysts and preside over the destruction of thousands of ozone molecules. So suddenly, it is discovered in 1974 that uh, the protective ozone there is in danger. What happens if it goes away? <coughs> Cataracts, skin cancer, uh, increased uh, susceptibility to disease because of uh, a dis diminishment of the human immune system. Uh, one of the drivers is, uh, are in this respect equivalent to AIDS. Um, so there's nothing, no special activity that you have to do in order to have your immune system suppressed, uh, except uh, the both for the same candidates you've been voting for. <laughs> But the main danger is not ours. The main danger is that we are at the top of a vast ecological curve, the food chain. And we are dependent, as all the allies on Earth is, on the base of the food chain. So to, to give a, uh, an example, which it, it's clearer, it's easier to describe, the oceanic food chain than the, uh, the land food chain, but the basic idea is the same. At the top of the world oceans, there are huge quantities of small one-celled plants called phytoplankton. They have to live near the top of the ocean because they have to grab ordinary visible light from the sun, uh, have to harvest it in order to, uh, to do their photosynthesis. These one-celled phytoplankton are eaten by one-celled zooplankton, the one-celled animals. <clears throat> Those guys are eaten by uh, uh, tiny crustacea. Little <laughs> uh, called krill. Those guys are eaten by little fish. Those guys are eaten by bigger fish. Those guys are eaten by still bigger fish. And those guys are eaten by dolphins, whales, and people. And that's the the herd. That's the food chain. Why about the phytoplankton at the bottom? The whole food chain unravels. The threat, the primary focus of that producers is the real danger of uh, the depletion of the ozone layer. So in 1974, it was discovered that there was a threat. Who made this discovery? Was it uh, scientists from the DuPont company exercising corporate responsibility? <laughs> Sadly, no. Was it scientists from the Environmental Protection Agency protecting us? Sadly, no. Was it scientists from the Department of Defense defending us? <laughs> Sadly, no. It was two ivory tower, white-coated, pure research scientists working at the University of California at Irvine, for heaven's sake. <laughs> Not even a high UV campus. They made the discovery which was promptly repudiated by the DuPont company that launched a major campaign, full page ads in scientific journals and, uh, and newspapers, saying this is only a theory. When it is demonstrated, we will, of course, stop producing CFCs. But it is not demonstrated. Demonstrated, I suppose, meant when uh, People over the earth start dropping dead. <laughs> then the market start making the CSCs. I mean, they didn't have to make a corporate decision. After a while, we'll be in customers and we'll be able to reduce the CSCs. So naturally, they would start making <laughs> uh, As things have turned out, the, uh, there was a, nature has been kind for us. There was a wholly unexpected, completely unpredicted hole in the Antarctic ozone layer. Uh, and uh, this was a precipitate event that, that led to uh, uh, semi-voluntary announcements of uh, curves in CFC production. Uh, it led to the so-called Montreal Protocol, which nations, many trusted nations came together and said they would phase out CFCs, but at a uh, 
a uh, rate comparable in terms of cost of the corporation's question. Uh, and as I hold at, at, at the above the north of middle latitudes, let's say, let's say uh, it would have been much more serious, major assumptions. In my view, we're moving in the right direction, but uh, not fast enough. Now notice, there's an interesting aspect of, of, of this issue. For one thing, it's not good enough for any one nation to, uh, to be reasonable, honest. No one nation controls the vast majority of COC. This is a global problem, and it has to be solved globally. Also, the CFC is made by one nation, don't just threaten that nation. Molecules don't carry passports. They don't know about national sovereignty. They've never heard about national boundaries. The general circulation of the atmosphere carries a CFC molecule made in Argentina to, uh, to do damage over to Spitzberg. Uh, or uh, or maybe, uh, the Republic of Gabon, or Laos. The world is one. The dangers of this technology, just like nuclear technology, are global. The other interesting aspect is that the consequences are long-term. If the average lifetime of a CFC molecule in the Earth's atmosphere is a century, then what we do now has consequences 100 years from now. Our grandchildren and great-grandchildren will have to live with whatever decisions we make now about the CFCs. It's not just us who have to pay the penalty. It's they who have nothing to do with these decisions. There is an interesting aspect in these problems. Uh, I'm sort of coming ahead to a conclusion, but I'm not exactly. That because of the global and transgenerational character of these issues, there is a silver lining. And that silver lining is it forces us to be bound together, all the nations and the generations. It provides us an important opportunity. Let me go on briefly to the uh, third such issue. They're not only three, but these are three which I think are, uh, are extremely insulting. They're also most dangerous. And that is global warming. Global warming comes about because we have a greenhouse effect in the Earth's atmosphere. The uh, Earth's atmosphere is largely transparent, except in places like Los Angeles, to the visible light from the sun. But significantly opaque in the infrared when the Earth does cool itself by radiating into space, the greenhouse gases of which water vapor and carbon dioxide are most abundant, uh, acts as a kind of blanket holding the uh, heat from the Earth in. Put more greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, the surface temperature will rise. It is not possible to calculate at the present rate at which carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases CFCs, by the way, also be greenhouse gas, oxides, nitrogen, methane. Are put into the atmosphere, what will happen to the global climate sometime in the future? No one finds these calculations are precise. Uh, certainly, in terms of weather, nobody thinks that. But I want to stress there's a difference between creating climate and creating weather. As everybody knows, you can't create weather even in this environmental regime. Uh, but you can't create very well climate, including the parameters of, of the Earth's atmosphere, and out comes the correct number for the global climate. And we can do that for the future. The consequences are that a greenhouse warming will uh, convert by about the year 2050 the American Midwest into something like a scrub desert. 2050 is very near term. I have a uh, six-year-old daughter. She'll be at uh, conventional retirement age. Uh, yes, that's fine. The American West is a very vast in the world. It's also a principal source of uh, America's prosperity. And it's not just here, it's 
all over the world. You look at those projection maps, and you'll find that uh, some places get warm, but other places get cool, and so let's move to those places. The whole world gets warm. Because of the uh, volume expansion of the uh, seawater, and some melting of glacial polar ice, and other consequences that sea level rises. And the projections by the end of the century are for a several million year rise in sea level. Which means, if no steps are taken to mitigate or prevent the inundation of all those cities on the planet. This is serious stuff on a very short time scale. And produced by what? Our dioxide is produced by the burning of fossil fuels. Goes straight back to the domestication of fire a million years ago. Who would have figured that we could do ourselves in by just burning wood, coal, petroleum, natural gas? It's bizarre. We have not been good at figuring out what the long term consequences will be. The consequence for increases in global warming are very serious. The steps that we need to take to mitigate the consequences are very clear. Let me mention four. One, much more effective. Uh, fuel efficiency, much more effective use of fossil fuels. So for example, in this room we have a bunch of incandescent lamps. If they were fluorescent lamps, they would equivalently be uh, putting 10% as much carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And this is like this is generated by coal fire. The, power plant, if there were fluorescent lamps here instead of incandescent lamps, there would only be one tenth as much coal burned to illuminate this room. Uh, there are, if we were smart, we would require much greater fuel efficiency in automobiles. Why is it necessary to uh, have high acceleration flashing automobiles. <laughs> that, uh, that only can do uh, 15 or 20 miles per gallon. 40 miles per gallon automobiles that go at quite respectable speeds uh, are 1960s, 1970s technology. We could have 60 or 80 miles per gallon automobiles. Automobiles produce uh, between a third and a half of all the CO2 emissions by the United States. Why don't we have fuel efficient automobiles? I, I know the answer, but it's a poor question. <laughs> That's one thing we could do. Second thing we could do would be much more quickly than we're doing, cut out the CFCs, because they are the greenhouse gas that is increasing most certainly. The third thing we could do is plant farms. Nature's way of taking CO2 out of the atmosphere is green plant photosynthesis, which eats carbon dioxide. We should be making sure that the amount of eating the carbon dioxide goes up. Instead, we, the human species, are destroying an acre of forest every second. Every second. There goes an acre of forest. There goes an acre of forest. There goes Night, day, month by month, year by year, forests are being annihilated. I know this is an issue of local concern here, and uh, local concern involves uh, uh, preserving habitats and preserving beauty and not for all that. But I stress there is a most important global reason to be not only preserved, but to be planting forests. Also, in the United States, the American Senate can go to, let's say, Brazil and say, 
You're out of your mind. What are you doing? You're destroying the, the rainforest. Don't you know how important that is? They want to hear the Brazilian too. And uh, they say, you come with dirty hands. You have no moral leverage to tell us what to do. Look what you've done to your country. It's another reason why we are useful to the United States to uh, reverse its policy, its de facto policy on trees. <clears throat> there is a uh, Virginia company, I'm sorry I forgot the name, uh, which uh, is in the process of building a coal-fired factory in Connecticut. And uh, they calculated how much CO2 would be put into the atmosphere by that factory over its presumptive lifetime. And then they committed to plant enough forests in Guatemala to remove the exact same amount of CO2 from the atmosphere. That is an example of responsible corporate behavior. There's no reason why that could be done. There's no reason why it couldn't be the law that it has to be done. And the fourth thing that we could do, if we had any sense, would be to devote significant research efforts to alternative energy sources, of which it seems to be clear solar energy is the safest, the most inexhaustible, the most promising. Uh, we'd like to go into that in some detail, but it's very good. It's interesting. Final point I'd like to make. but it will take us to uh, a few other issues, it has to do with cost. To do the sorts of uh, things I've been talking about, cost money. To do the sort of things I've been talking about for, for global warming, it's going to take a lot of money. It's also going to take a lot of political effort. I could imagine that the coal oil, natural gas, automobile, and lumber industries would be opposed to the program that I have suggested to you. Uh, it seems to me they have a great deal of political leverage. The political problem about how to accomplish these uh, changes, which are so obviously needed, is a very serious one. Beyond that, there is a, an economic issue. How are we going to pay for all that? How are we going to pay for the conversion of uh, most of the electric power grid in the United States to put a solar energy in Europe? If it ever has its fusion energy. Where's that money come from? It's flat. If you look at the problems that face our nation, you see that there are many problems before us that will not wait that are very expensive, but very expensive, I mean hundreds of billions of dollars or more. Hundred billion dollars is a typical cost of a strategic weapon system. So that's something very hard to think about. Urban and interurban infrastructure, the decay of roads, highways, streets, sewers, aqueducts, all over the United States, bridges, tunnels. The estimated cost of fixing that up, not lavish, but just making everything keep working, is one to three trillion dollars. That's the national debt, I mean the national debt, about which everybody's so worried. You have to spend that money again just to keep the infrastructure going so people can get to work, have water to drink, and so on. A new one that uh, three years ago was not anybody's agenda. Bailing out the savings and loan industry. Who would have figured that do that? For many hundreds of billions of dollars. And the people who sold the money that's in effect math. Don't have to do anything. They're off the hook. Nuclear waste. Nuclear waste in weapons facilities. Clean that up. Now with the GP 
a multi hundred billion dollar effort. And then there's the railways in commercial facilities. There's also a large range of other kinds of toxic wastes that are just common sitting there for the early generation. There is infant mortality. The United States is 20th in the world in infant mortality. 19 other nations save their babies better than we do. What does it take? It's only a question of money. Medical care, which converts back to money. And education, which converts back to money. Why should other nations save the lives of their babies? And we can't do it. You sometimes hear, you hear a lot more about the value of life in other countries is, uh, is lower than here. Uh, I think the infant mortality statistics are a good way to calibrate the value of life. Homeless people, malnutrition, education. Yes. 
to make nuclear arsenals, but in the conventional forces as well. You cannot do that on your own, apart from other countries, but we have the remarkable, this is a remarkable woman in history, when the Soviet Union is saying, let's cut nuclear and conventional weapons. We will do it asymmetrically in conventional forces, the Soviets say. They say they recognize they have larger forces in Europe. They say it doesn't threaten anybody, but we don't have to leave them. But they say they will cut disproportionately pretty much if the United States goes along as well. Well, just recently, after a lot of chili challenging the Bush administration has some come out with a, uh, what might be understood as a constructive response um, to that, to that offer by the Soviets. And that, it seems to me, is the linchpin of everything else that, uh, of all the other problems that are facing us. And so I would urge you, no matter which of the problems I wish that you're concerned about, deforestation in our even more talented any of those to work for safe, intrusively inspected, massive conventional force reductions by weapon in Europe. I want to conclude, and uh, I want to conclude by going back to what I said near the beginning about the advantages of space exploration. One of the unexpected consequences of the Apollo missions to the moon is that for the first time we got photographs of the whole Earth. The Earth in color, the Earth seen from a distance. And it was really remarkable. I think it has had a powerful, if uh, often unconscious effect, the way we view our planet. No national boundaries in evidence. Those are made by people. Those are man made, I guess I can say that pretty accurately because women may very few of those numbers. Um, you see a blue and white world, lovely, fragile, exquisitely sensitive to the degradation of the human beings, and nothing else like it in the whole solar system. importance of preserving this planet, of recognizing its unity, and of committing ourselves to work together with everyone else on Earth to preserve and enhance the life on that planet and to have as our primary loyalty the planet and the human species. Thank you.
not as bad as you might think. Uh, so self-education is, uh, is essential. It's not hard because there are still is freedom of speech in this country. So we will be needing to find uh, the answer to uh, almost all the questions. Uh, then there's the, the issue of children. One thing that I would urge you to do in the course of that self-education, you may already be self-educated on this, uh, I don't know. But one thing that's very important to do is to equip yourself with what um, I'll call a baloney detection kit. <laughs> Let's see how much the 
operations, especially putting in the uh, cities close to the burning of cities. We cannot, with uh, global temperature declines, or at least going to hemisphere temperature declines in the 15 to 20 degree centigrade range. Absolutely enormous. The temperature difference between the global climate today and the global uh, climate at the worst of the last ice age is six to eight degrees centigrade. Here we're talking about two to three times that temperature decline. It was too much we were convinced we made a mistake. So we tried to went back over here we got it in the calculation. Uh, this was a uh, vast computer model. As you said, it's only based on calculation. We haven't had a global nuclear war yet. We had a good about this. <laughs> uh, so uh, this is one of those uh, issues where you can only you can only calculate beforehand. But that doesn't mean that you have a great deal of fume to pretend whatever you want. The uh, input parameters and calculations are constrained by what we know and by the laws of physics. Well, we went over every step of the calculations. And uh, every now and then we, we found something, well, maybe we made a mistake here. And so we would then go in and attack it in greater detail. There were also, as you might imagine, other scientists who were here to help us in finding mistakes in the calculations. Um, and what always happened was that it turned out we didn't make a mistake. Emotion. My, uh, my first response was, we just went something. But, oh, terrific, we didn't make a mistake in the calculation. That's right. Great. And then, a few seconds later, that was followed by another thought, which was uh, too bad. Um, what a ghastly conclusion. That is such enormous potential capacity is in our hands. So, if someone tomorrow came out with uh, with a uh, flaw in our calculations and it turned out that it was valid, I would gladly withdraw the uh, project. It would be a much safer environment if it would be as good as possible. Unfortunately, that does not seem to be the case. There was uh, a lot of uh, objections on ideological grounds, as you can imagine. Uh, if country A attacks country B, and country B massive attack, country B does not retaliate. The smoke and dust sprays over the country B and certainly attack around the planet. Over country A, country A has committed an elaborate national suicide. This is called self deterrence <laughs> And it pulls the rug out from under the uh, standard specifications for nuclear objects <clears throat> that we have to be able to read. Uh, and so there were powerful, so what, powerful ideological objections. In addition, there were uh, a few scientists who did some calculations which got, instead of, uh, let's say, 20 degrees centigrade, only 10 degrees centigrade. They called it nuclear water. <laughs> But I, I point out to you that 10 degrees is more than the temperature difference between now and the last ice age. There's nothing to sneeze at. Who's worried about oil? Uh, we should be. But more than that, those calculations now turn out to be based on, I'm going to say, uh, the, uh, it depends on how high you put the smoke. If you put the smoke low in the atmosphere, the effect is not as strong, and it doesn't last as long. Put it high up. Bigger temperature decline, and, uh, and it lasts much longer because long enough the smoke doesn't fall out. <coughs> uh, it is now recognized that the new water calculations were the result of putting the smoke too low in the atmosphere. And we know the same guys with the smoke at the level that the best data on how high the smoke would go suggest they get the same answers as we do. So, unfortunately, no real interest. There's some other recent developments which uh, make it seem that it's uh, even a little more serious than it's said. Uh, I hope that answers your question. Yes? I'm a car at the University of Portland here in town. In the list of uh, crises or problems that you've cited, how would you include in that some sort of ranking the problem 
pollution by ocean, but the surface pollution includes it in as much as it can and the deep pollution through waste of all types of nuclear waste. Well, I, uh, I don't want to pretend that I'm an expert on, uh, on that issue. <coughs> but uh, I do not know of any calculations that suggest that uh, that it could be life threatening to the global ecosystem on a top scale deck. I mean, you know, if there is no prospect for it being so serious on such a short time scale, then I would say it's not in the same same level as the as the problems that I, that I mentioned. That's not at all to suggest that it's not that it's not serious. <coughs> and uh, you know, we're very ignorant about, about the oceans, you know, oceanic circulation. Uh, to say nothing of the biological. In fact, that's another place where, uh, where we are behaving tremendously irresponsible. We should have sort of terraria and aquaria uh, on a large scale in which we change the physical conditions, in which we increase the radiation dose to match that of a uh, nuclear war or a, uh, of a serious uh, nuclear power plant failure, in which we uh, Reduce the temperatures and uh, the light levels to simulate the uh, nuclear winter, or increase the temperatures to uh, to simulate global warming, or increase the ultraviolet light to simulate the uh, ozone sphere depletion, uh, and simulate changes in the oceans. And let's see what the consequences are. But uh, surely ecology is not a uh, first principle of science, which we just calculate what the consequences. If we were responsible, that's what we would be doing. And uh, I bet you, it would turn out that the consequences are even more serious than you imagine because of synergisms, um, ways in which uh, several environmental factors may be interacting. Uh, so, absolutely serious, maybe not as serious as some of the issues. Yes, please. Problems or global ones, would you uh, recommend or do you believe that a world organization such as the United Nations should be the ones initiating uh, some of the solutions that you talked as for taking the leadership, or should, uh, do you believe it should be the United States really uh, taking the leadership of these solutions? Those are not the only two alternatives. Um, another alternative is that the consortium of nations. Uh, involved in whatever the issue is, they get to so on on the new Congress, or it's certainly true that uh, every nation on Earth has to worry about the consequences of nuclear war, including those in the Southern Hemisphere. Still, the number of nuclear armed nations is, uh, is very few. And uh, uh, the fetish of sovereignty being what it is, perhaps it would be best for those nations to negotiate among themselves goes to a global forum uh, like the United Nations. On greenhouse warming, on the other hand, uh, the developing world contributes a significant amount because there's a learning of wood. There's not people learning wood. That's a significant contribution to CO2. So even if all the industrial nations uh, were to agree on greenhouse warming and to make massive cuts, it still wouldn't be enough. It would delay the uh, solve this problem without involving the, uh, the developing world. So in that issue, the United Nations is the proper form. So uh, I would say it depends on which of the global environmental issues we're talking about. One salutary uh, development in, uh, on the nuclear arms issue, uh, this is to sort of balance what I said, is the development of the, the emergence of the uh, so-called five continent peace initiative in which the uh, heads of state or government of non-nuclear powers uh, partly motivated by the discovery of nuclear winter said, so, look, well, we, uh, we can lose everything. If the United States and the Soviet Union decide to have a war, it was all nuclear weapons, only not on their territory. Nevertheless, we in Tanzania, we in Greece, we in Argentina, we in Mexico, uh, can be the sort of thing. So 
And so they made a uh, set of, of passionate appeals to the United States and the Soviet Union to, uh, to change their way of, uh, of building things. The Soviet Union was very responsive. The United States potentially, potentially dismissed uh, the uh, thought that it needs an issue. But, you know, we're coming to our sense. Well, so even there, I think there is a role for, for other nations since every nation on Earth is at in general um, because of these, of these issues. Have I commented? Yes. Uh, would, you consult, uh, would you support that consortium being one of not only political leaders but scientists and engineers? It seems that a lot of our discussions on a uh, world uh, basis and in a lot of organizations that they are more politicians and more political leaders versus always having or making sure our representatives are really scientists and engineers and have that background to really talk from a technical aspect. I certainly think that there are scientists and engineers in such discussions, but you have to remember scientists and engineers are uh, human beings just like everybody else. Uh, they uh, can be swayed, although perhaps not as much as everybody else, by national prejudice, by uh, the political beliefs, by the uh, the question of where their salaries are coming from and who's paying for it, and uh, by the uh, attractions of power. Certainly, I don't want to offend the, my premier or my president, so I'll swallow my scruples and go along with what they say. Lots of scientists don't want to do that. So uh, we, we shouldn't imagine that uh, there's a special uh, wisdom uh, that goes with being a, a scientist. That was the scientific inclination is central to solve these issues. Two sure of the scientists ought to be involved. Two more. Whose need is greatest? <laughs> Now, 
eight years later. Born to two's trajectory, Cook in 1986 was close to encounter with the This fall is 25th. It will make the first encounter with the Mount Neptune. Its wounds, its uh, presumptive green marks upon uh, itself. And the spacecraft, both of them, have enormously exceeded the design specifications of, of their buildings. Um, they are a benign technology. The results are made available to all the world, essentially, in real time. They have given us the first close-up knowledge of some 40 new worlds. Worlds that were at best fuzzy disks in the telescopes, some points of light, and a large number wholly unknown before or two spacecraft are now on the planetary frontier. Uh, right now, Pluto is interior to the orbit of Neptune, somewhere at the edge of the solar system, which is the planetary part. And now these spacecraft uh, venture out of the solar system altogether. They are our emissaries into interstellar space. Uh, the, this is a tremendously uh, hopeful, optimistic, exploratory, open use of technology. Even those who have great reservations about uh, this other aspect of American boss have great admiration uh, for this kind of technology. Uh, and in the long historical perspective, the first spacecraft to, uh, to explore the limits of the solar system will be in every history uh, for thousands of years. I mean, if, we, if we do not if we have a wisdom not to destroy ourselves, we will be out there. We will be exploring the world of the universe. We will have self perpetuating, self contained adaptation on those worlds. And all going back to, uh, to Voyager. I think this kind of step is as significant as uh, the long run as when our amphibian ancestors first crawled out onto the land. Uninhabited environment some uh, four or five hundred million years ago, and as significant as uh, our, uh, our oral combat ancestors came out from the trees onto the savannas. Uh, it, it is his arms, it is a mess. And uh, the whole Voyager spacecraft, their design, construction, launch, and mission operations, and data analysis costs about as much as two B2 bombers. Uh, so that's an example of a lot of other things. There are obviously a lot of other things in, uh, in medicine and public health sanitation and so on. But I, I, I think uh, for me, for some personally, 